started as a normal day, just like any other. I took a shower and grabbed a quick cup of coffee before heading out of the front door and waving goodbye to my loving wife. I jumped on board the bus, sat down, turned on my MP3 player, and promptly entered my usual daydream state. I finally arrived at my office building, headed up the 10th floor and sat down at my desk to see a huge pile of paperwork. I sighed and got started. A scream coming from down the hall broke my concentration. I considered going to see what it was, but the thought quickly passed. Probably just another hysterical secretary overreacting to a spider. Just as I started getting back to work, something else grabbed my attention. I peered out the window into the street below, and to my astonishment, saw a scene of utter chaos. People fighting, even killing each other for seemingly no reason. By this time, some of my coworkers had gotten up from their desks and joined me in staring out the window. said that a new breed of virus had been discovered, one that would change its victims into a homicidal maniac. This virus was highly contagious and spreading rapidly. Their advice was to stay where I was, and that if I were to encounter an infected person, I should try to destroy their brain. At this point, I felt myself entering a state of mild shock. It was obvious that whatever was going on was serious, and that a significant percentage of the population were going to be killed or wounded over the course of the next few days. My thoughts quickly turned to my wife. Was she okay? What if these maniacs were near our home? I knew that the phone lines would most likely be overwhelmed, so I decided not to waste time by calling. I headed straight home. I began to make my way through a series of corridors that lead to the elevator. On my way, I noticed a struggle out of the corner of my eye. I turned to see a disfigured man frantically clawing at and biting a young woman's leg. Blood was already pouring from her multiple wounds. The woman cried out for me to help her. I began to look for somebody to help. But all of my fellow co-workers seemed to be far more interested in saving their own skins. By the time I returned to the office, both the crazed man and the wounded woman had gone. I decided to continue to the elevator. I arrived at the elevator, but to my dismay it seemed many other people had the same idea. I heard a ping and the elevator doors slid open. In a split second, the large crowd of office staff pushed and shoved their way into the tiny metal box. I quickly made my way down the stairs to the ground floor. Sure, I was a little out of breath, but at least I saved time and avoided a potentially lethal situation. I eventually reached the ground floor and entered the lobby. The scene in front of me was one of extreme violence. The security team was desperately battling with a swarm of infected, and they appeared to be losing. I watched helplessly as a guard on the opposite side of the room was torn limb from limb. I noticed his gun lying on the floor just a few meters away from his dismembered corpse. I managed to slip away without any infected noticing and proceeded quickly towards the rear exit. I made my way through several corridors towards the back of the building. As I approached the rear entrance, I spotted a hefty padlock across the bolt, making it practically impossible to open without a key. I cursed my bad luck and tried to figure out my next move. The janitor would have had the key, but reaching his office would have required going back towards the lobby. I realized that breaking the door down would be impossible, and that heading back would be too dangerous, so I set about searching for another exit. I remembered
remembered that there was a small window in the male bathroom just a few doors down the corridor. I arrived at the bathroom door and pushed it open. Suddenly, I heard a bestial roar coming from further down the corridor. A dozen infected had spotted me and were now heading in my direction. I quickly entered the stall and spotted the window I was thinking of. However, to my dismay, it was much smaller than I had remembered. I thought that I would probably fit, but I knew it was going to be a very tricky maneuver. Not wanting to waste time, I set about trying to squeeze through the window. A few awkward movements and a lot of pain later, I managed to force my way into the street, escaping the infected with only a few seconds to spare. I dropped from the window and landed on the pavement with a heavy thud. Looking up and down the quiet back street, I tried to decide what to do next. Eventually I came to the conclusion that my best bet was to head to a main road and try to steal a vehicle or catch a lift. I jogged down the quiet street for a few hundred feet before stopping to catch my breath. I looked up briefly and saw a little girl wandering aimlessly in the middle of the road. I called out to the little girl. She slowly turned towards me before looking up, letting out a ghastly scream and charging towards me. My instincts told me that she was infected, and I immediately began to run in the opposite direction. Luckily, her legs simply weren't long enough to keep pace with me. Within a couple of minutes, she had lost my scent. I eventually arrived at the main road. As I suspected, the scene wasn't pretty. In every direction, I could see people either trying to fight or flee from the numerous infected. An array of dismembered corpses already littered the streets. I suddenly felt nauseous, and within a few moments I was vomiting my breakfast all over the pavement. I wiped my mouth with my sleeve and looked up to see a bus driving down the street. The number was the same as the one I usually took home. There appeared to be a lot of people on board already, but I thought I might be able to squeeze in. I realized that getting on the crowded bus probably wasn't a good idea. If someone on board were infected, then there would have been no escape. As I continued down the street, I noticed several groups of people. Just across the road was a group of men with rifles. They appeared to be having fun shooting the zombies rather than trying to escape. In the alley, I could just about see a group of teenage boys armed with a variety of makeshift melee weapons. A few meters from where I was standing, a paramedic and an armed police officer were helping a wounded man, and as I glanced over my shoulder, I saw a group of survivors from my office building heading in the same direction. I decided that it was probably best to team up with other survivors. I jogged over to the group of my fellow co-workers. They seemed happy to see me. I told the group that I thought we should try to find some transportation to get out of the city center. One of them suggested we go to the parking area a few blocks down. We quickly agreed to our strategy and made our way down the street. As we approached the car parking area, we noticed a few infected wandering idly around the entrance. There was no real way to avoid them. I began making as much noise as I could, running in circles around the infected. My plan worked, and they began to follow me away from the entrance. The others swiftly entered the parking area and began searching for a suitable vehicle. I was glad they had made it inside but I was still in serious danger. I eventually managed to lose the infected and quickly caught up with the others. But I promised myself I'd never volunteer to be bait again. We eventually found a few different options for vehicles in which we could make our escape. On the far side of the parking area, we found a pair of road motorbikes. Closer to us was a four-wheel drive all-terrain Jeep, a large freight truck, and a convertible sports car. I suggested that we take the Jeep, and the others quickly agreed. 
Having the ability to go off-road if necessary would be incredibly useful, especially since many roads would have been blocked with traffic, accidents, or zombies. We approached the jeep and peered inside. To our dismay, we saw a pair of infected inside, desperately clawing at the windows in an attempt to escape. I made my suggestion, but the others didn't listen. They really wanted that jeep, and a few zombies weren't going to stand in their way. The others immediately flung open the doors and started trying to drag the zombies out. However, without my help, they were having serious trouble, and it seemed like they would most likely end up dead if I didn't intervene. I headed towards the motorbike, and didn't look back. I climbed aboard my chosen vehicle and sped away from the car park onto the main street. By then the roads were littered with bodies and car wreckages. It was all I could do to avoid them. Everywhere I looked, I could see only scenes of carnage. It seemed that those not already infected were fighting a losing battle. My thoughts quickly turned to my wife. I tried to tell myself that she would be okay, but that didn't stop the horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. I knew I had to get home as soon as possible. In the distance I could see a gas station with a few of the zombies on the forecourt. I quickly glanced down at the fuel gauge and saw that I only had about a half a tank remaining. I decided not to stop for gas or supplies due to the potential danger. Half a gas tank was more than enough to get home anyway. I continued down the road before turning onto the main highway out of town. However, it wasn't long before I noticed a mass of vehicles blocking the road ahead. The combined sound of all the honking, shouting, and screaming was deafening. Nobody had kept to their lanes, and cars were packed so closely together that not even a bicycle could squeeze through. The blockage extended so far down the road that it was literally impossible to discern what the cause was. there was no point in waiting for the traffic to clear, and that without the jeep, driving off the road was just too dangerous. I headed back the way I came and turned off the highway at the first exit. I soon found a safer, albeit less direct, route home. As I sped down the disturbingly quiet back road, my mind began to wander. Without the distraction of imminent danger, I began to remember the horrific scenes I had witnessed just an hour ago. Images of mangled corpses flashed before my eyes, and my head began to spin. I swerved onto the wrong side of the road, just as another vehicle pulled out from a concealed entrance. I braked sharply, but it was too late to avoid a collision. Amazingly, I wasn't seriously injured, but my ride was badly damaged. I walked over to the car, and I opened the driver's door. He was unconscious, but didn't seem to be badly wounded. As I wondered what to do next, I noticed three large bite marks on his upper arm and realized that it wouldn't be long before he became one of the infected. I decided to leave him and continue on foot. After a half an hour of walking, I began to recognize my surroundings and knew that I would soon be home. There were several different routes I could take. get off the main road as it would undoubtedly be dangerous in such a heavily populated area. I decided to follow the train line instead since it ran not far from my house and would be totally deserted. Sure enough, I didn't see another soul. I finally arrived in my neighborhood, exhausted. I knew that my house was just a little further down the street, but the area was swarming with the infected. Most of them seemed distracted by what few survivors remained, but I knew it was only a matter of time before they noticed me. I remembered about a small alleyway nearby, one that would take me most of the way home in relative safety. I entered the alley, and as expected, it seemed totally devoid of life. 
However, as I walked past a large dumpster, an infected old man stepped out of the shadows and tried to grab me. I grabbed him by the neck, realizing that he'd be unable to bite me. I pushed him away as hard as I could, and he stumbled backward. I had bought myself valuable time, but it wouldn't take long for the creature to regain its balance and come at me again. I turned to run back the way I had came, only to see that another group of them had followed and were now blocking my retreat. My only hope was to try and get past the lone infected. I grabbed a brick and threw it at my assailant as hard as I could. It hit him in the shoulder, which barely seemed to affect him at all. Before I could try anything else, I grabbed him by the neck. Grabbing a brick, I waited just long enough for the infected to get close before smashing it into his face. There was a sickening crack as his jawbone fractured and blood sprayed from his mouth. My former neighbor fell to the ground, and before he could get back up, I was able to run past. I sped down the alley and back onto the street. When I looked over my shoulder, there was no sign of my pursuers. I could see my house now, just 100 feet or so away. My heart sank when I saw yet another group of infected wandering aimlessly between me and my goal. I decided that it was too dangerous to carry on down the street. I went around the back of one of the neighbor's houses and climbed over the fence into their garden. It was tiring but I carried on scrambling over the fences until I got to my own backyard. As I approached the house, I noticed the glass in the back door had been smashed and the door left slightly ajar. I was terrified for my wife's safety. I realized that whoever had broken into the house could still be in there and without a weapon, I wouldn't be able to help my wife. I headed over to the shed and checked my pockets. Luckily I still had my keys and was able to remove the padlock and open the door. Inside there was a wide range of tools to choose from. I picked up the hand axe since it was light and easy to use, although perhaps not the most powerful of weapons. With my weapon in hand, I left the shed and walked back to my house. Before I could enter, I discovered why the back door had been left ajar. A teenage looter emerged from the house carrying my television, obviously intent on profiting from the crisis. When he saw me, he dropped the TV and pulled out a large kitchen knife. At that moment, I couldn't tell which one of us was more afraid. I told the looter that I wasn't going to hurt him and that he could take the TV and go. He didn't bother to pick it back up. Instead, he ran over to the nearby fence and climbed over into the neighbor's garden. Having dealt with the looter, I walked in through the back door. I was relieved to finally be safely indoors, but I couldn't rest yet. Not until I was certain my wife was okay. I quickly shut the back door and locked it, then looked around for some furniture to wedge in front of it. It took me a few minutes to properly secure the entrance, but at least I knew nobody would be able to force their way in. I began searching the ground floor for my wife. As I came into the living room, I saw that John from next door was standing there. He had his back to me and was clearly oblivious to my presence. His shirt was covered in red stains. John was surely infected so I snuck up behind him and hit him as hard as I could on the back of the head. His skull made a satisfying crack and he fell to the floor, dead. I had never liked him much anyway. As I went to go upstairs, I noticed a note had been left for me by the front door. I recognized my wife's handwriting immediately. The note said that she couldn't wait for me any longer and that she was going to pack her bags and take the car to her parents' house in the countryside. As I read the note, my heart sank. I prayed that she would be able to make it to her parents in one piece, 
but knowing how hard it had been for me to get here, I couldn't help but wonder if she was still alive. When I realized I may never see her again, I began to feel tears rolling down my cheek. I pulled myself together and resolved to keep searching. I needed to make sure the house was secure before planning my next move. As I climbed the stairs, I heard an odd shuffling noise coming from my bedroom. I didn't know if it was my wife, a looter, or another of the infected. I slowly pushed the door open and stepped inside. The scene that greeted me will haunt my nightmares for years to come. My beautiful wife was pinned on the floor, desperately trying to fight off one of the infected. She could barely keep the creature at bay, and if I didn't act immediately, she would surely die. Wasting no time at all, I smashed the infected over the head with my weapon. I was lucky not to hit my wife by mistake, but at least she was alive. I was finally reunited with my wife. I dropped the weapon and held her as tightly as I could. In that moment, I was happier than I had ever been, yet the feeling would not last long. I asked her if she was okay, and she showed me her hand. Blood dripped from several bite marks on her fingers. I didn't know if she would become infected or not, or even how much longer she had. She sobbed as I struggled to decide what to do. I had to do something and do it quickly. If I could stop the spread of the infection, I might just be able to save her life. We ran down to the kitchen, took a clean meat cleaver from the knife rack, and tied an improvised tourniquet around her wrist. Within seconds it was over, and I was carefully dressing the wounds with bandages from our first aid kit. I didn't know if she would survive or not, but at least now we had hope. My wife and I spent some time discussing what to do next. We realized that we couldn't stay in the house forever, as it was just too dangerous this close to civilization. We decided that our best bet was to load up the car with food and supplies and then head for her parents' house out in the country. I made sure the house was secure, dragged the corpses down to the basement, and then helped my wife get everything ready. She looked pale and weak, but it didn't seem like she would turn. At least not for a while yet. By the time everything was ready, it was already nightfall, so we decided to spend one more night at home before hitting the road. I don't think either of us slept that night, but it was better than traveling in the dark. We left at dawn, 